Humans tell stories. Among all the creatures who also call this planet home, it is the one thing that makes us unique. We have complex, highly structured societies. So do ants. We use tools to manipulate our surroundings. So do chimpanzees. What we and our remarkably large brains have done that no other inhabitants of Earth have is organized the world with language, formed narratives of what we saw, and passed those stories down through generations. What we haven't always been quite as good at is listening. Whether it's the ideas that clash with our own, or the meaning and countless happenings around us, when presented with challenging information, we seem to be deaf. Perhaps we are so busy sharing our stories and opinions that we lose the focus necessary to be still, be silent, and understand. The great irony is that without anyone to listen, even our most beautiful stories are nothing but chatter and noise. And while this may seem especially true in today's polarized political climate, a look back at history shows that we've faced these issues before. Perhaps no greater cultural clash is written in our history than the arrival of Europeans in the Americas. Looking at the mythological stories of Native American cultures, as well as their reception in Europe at the time, we're given a clear picture of both the value and benefits of cross-cultural dialogue and the dangers that arise when meaningful language falls on metaphorically deaf ears. Through an analysis of important Native American stories and beliefs, we will be able to apply traditional American views on humanity's relationship with nature to gain a deeper understanding of our relationship with each other. My name is Sean. Welcome to Mythos and Logos. The Iroquois, native to the Great Lakes region around upstate New York and southern parts of Ontario and Quebec, have told their stories many times over many years. One of the first Iroquois to write these stories, however, was John Norton. Norton, raised in Scotland to a Scottish mother and a Cherokee father, was adopted into the Mohawk Nation in British Canada after being stationed outside Toronto in the British military. He was adopted by Chief Joseph Brandt, a celebrated political and military leader and one of the most influential figures in Iroquois history. Norton's adoption by such a prominent chief was actually not controversial, despite the difficulties one might expect from a European-raised, devout Christian like Norton joining a society he had no blood connection to. But this was not a problem because, to the Iroquois, belonging to the tribe didn't depend on one's birth ethnicity, family, or religion. So if anyone, even a Cherokee from Scotland, could learn the language and culture of one of the six Iroquois nations, they would be considered a member every bit as much as someone born into it. It is perhaps his dedicated study of and respect for the culture that led John Norton to publish these stories in English. His mythological journal begins... In the beginning, before the formation of the earth, the country above the sky was inhabited by superior beings, over whom the Great Spirit presided. His daughter having become pregnant, he pulled up a great tree by the roots, and threw her through the hole thereby formed. But to prevent her utter destruction, he previously ordered the great turtle to wait on the surface of the water to receive her on it. Many versions of this story have been shared over the years, all with some differences in details. Some say that the Sky Woman wasn't pushed, but fell to Earth when she curiously examined the hole in the sky. Some speak of the birds of the sky gathering together to cushion her fall onto the turtle's back, while creatures swim to the bottom of the ocean, grabbing mud to place on the great turtle's shell. All, however, 
tell that the great turtle grows in time, eventually to hold up all of North America. A traditional native name for the continent, Turtle Island, comes from this story. Sounds like a fun place to visit. In time, the Sky Woman gives birth and delivers twins, one good and one evil. This is detailed by David Cusick, another of the earliest Iroquois authors. Cusick was born rather than adopted into the Iroquois and did not share Norton's formal education. But when Cusick saw how little most Europeans knew of his culture, he taught himself English in order to gather and share as detailed of a history as he could. One of the infants in her womb was moved by evil, and he was determined to pass out his mother's side, and the other infant, in vain, tried to stop him. The woman was in great pain during her delivery, and died shortly after. After a time, the turtle increased to a great island, and the infants were grown up, and one of them was gentle, named the Good Mind, and the other was insolent, and named the Bad Mind. Both Norton and Cusick told of the brothers' time in the world. The Good Mind, seeing the Earth's potential, creates calm rivers and humans, while the Bad Mind, jealous, creates dangerous mountains, rough rivers, and venomous snakes to stop them. As the children grow, the bad mind excels at hunting, while the good mind struggles. That is, until a mystical encounter with the figure who tells him, My son, I have seen your distress and heard your solitary lamentations. I now come to comfort you. I am your father and will be your protector. Therefore, take courage. Take this giving him an ear of maize. Plant it. It will yield you a certain support, independent of the hunt. And at the same time, it will render more palatable the meats that you gain. I am the great turtle which supports the earth, on which you move. Your brother's ill treatment will increase with his years. Bear it with patience until the time appointed before which shall hear further. The good mind plants and cares for the corn and discovers that his evil brother has captured all of the animals and hidden them in a cave where only he could use them. The good mind frees the animals and is later told by a deer that his brother, angry at him for freeing his captives, plans to kill him. The deer gives his antlers to the good mind as a weapon to use when the time comes. When the fight begins, it rages throughout the earth, and the brothers' battle cries become the languages of each group of humans. In time, the good mind wins, banishing his evil brother and allowing humans to live in the world unimpeded. In this story, and the many ways it has been told, we can see its message of the importance of respecting nature. The Sky Woman only lives after having her fall cushioned by the animals, and is saved by the turtle who agrees to carry not only her, but the entire continent. The Bad Mind's success at hunting turns out to be a result of him keeping the creatures trapped which causes both the good mind and the humans he created to struggle against starvation. When the good mind is given corn, it is as a gift from the same great turtle who saved the Sky Woman. By respecting the creatures, he's even gifted knowledge from them, which will save his life. Signs of this tradition are present throughout North America, but we'll save most of those for later episodes. If nature is to be viewed as a gift, to be treated with respect, should it come as any surprise how, for example, the Lakota Sioux of the Great Plains are known to revere and use every part of the buffalo after a traditional hunt? As the Native American scholar Ron Zellinger wrote, 
The creature gave up its own flesh and life to feed them. It provided for their every need. A buffalo symbol or buffalo skull is present in all sacred Lakota rituals. It stands as a reminder of this great animal which gives completely of itself for others. The buffalo is a symbol of self-sacrifice. It gives until there is nothing left. And Native American stories aren't always that specific, by the way. Paul Lejeune, a French Catholic missionary, studied the culture of the Montagnier of Northern Quebec and wrote of their prayers how on a typical morning, children would exit their houses calling for animals to come. And adults in the harsh Northern Canadian winter would regularly cry out their hopes for health and a mild spring. When Lejeune asked what the spirits that the Montagnier prayed to were like, they replied that they did not know exactly what form they had, but they were quite sure they were living, for they heard them, though they could not tell what they were saying. Though there are many diverse traditions, stories, and rituals in Native American cultures, this common idea of spirits inhabiting the world and its creatures shows an underlying tradition of animism. Unlike Judaism, vegetarianism, Marxism, or most other isms, animism, which by the way comes from the Latin word animas, meaning spirit or breath, does not describe a specific or codified set of beliefs, but instead a broad view of all of creation as one natural family. A typical pet owner today would certainly call their dog a part of the family, regardless of their species. Animus beliefs take that idea of family and apply it to all of creation. And when all of creation shares in the same type of spirit, the importance of respect and communication in Native American cultures becomes clear. Getting life-saving advice from a deer, as the good mind did in the Iroquois story, requires that one listen. Hoarding these creatures, as the bad mind did, is not only a crime against the humans who need them, but also to the natural spirits themselves. The Lakota ritual of reverence and thanks for the buffalo is especially moving when the buffalo's sacrifice is seen as the sacrifice of an equal. And the hopeful prayers of the Montagnier, directed to no one in particular, suddenly resemble the lonely cries of the good mind, which were answered by the great turtle with the gift of corn. The animism of Native American mythology, having enabled the people to see the world around them as equal to themselves, is symbolized inside of the stories that they told. And if the wisdom in these stories gained from nature has led to them being told for centuries, if that wisdom was important enough for David Cusick to learn English just to share it, how much more wisdom might we have to gain from each other? When Columbus returned from the New World, it soon became clear to the Spanish that they were dealing with something entirely beyond what they expected. While they expected a shorter, safer route to India, they had instead encountered an entire continent of uncontacted peoples. The empire's most influential thinkers began debating how to interact. The Spanish crown's one non-negotiable was the conversion of the New World to Christianity. See, the monarchy claimed its legitimacy not from the people, but from the approval of the Pope, and thereby of the Catholic Church. The philosopher Juan Ginés de Sepúlveda advised the crown to accomplish this goal of conversion by any means necessary. Citing Aristotle, Sepúlveda argued based on Aristotle's beliefs that Native Americans lack the capacity for reason and were naturally destined to be enslaved and converted by force. So the philosopher attempted to convince Spain's nobility to expand slavery in the Americas. By the way, he had never actually been to the New World. But Sepulveda was opposed by one of Spain's most influential figures at the time, Bartolomé de las Casas. Las Casas was a bishop who was instrumental in passing laws limiting slavery in Spanish America. 
He had lived in Venezuela, Guatemala, and Mexico, and had spent years in peaceful dialogue with the native people he met there. Don't get me wrong, Las Casas' goal was conversion, and he was convinced of the superior truth of his Christian faith. But he developed a great admiration for the cultures he encountered, even arguing that their mythology and traditions were greater than those in Europe, writing, These Indian peoples surpassed the Greeks and Romans in selecting for their gods not sinful and criminal men, but virtuous ones. The nation which has elected virtuous men as God or gods has a better concept and estimation of God and more natural purity than one which has selected and accepted for God or gods, men known to be sinful and criminal. The latter was the case of the Greek and Roman states, while the former is that of all these Indian nations. Even though Las Casas was convinced that he was right and they were wrong, he was still wise enough to understand that he and the rest of Spanish, and thereby European society, had something to learn from Native American mythology and culture. His persistence and dedication to his values mirrored the values found in Native American animism and the way that Native mythology encourages humans to see themselves as equals to their surroundings, Las Casas was among the first Europeans to argue for humans to see themselves as equals to each other. In this way, Las Casas' performance when he finally met Sepulveda in debate can be seen as one of the earliest arguments for universal human dignity. The long legacy of cultural studies and exchange today along with the fruitful wisdom that has resulted from that legacy, is modern proof that Las Casas was right in his aim to understand the natives. Entire fields, including mythology, philosophy, and more, would not exist, simply would not exist, without humans of differing beliefs respectfully meeting as dignified equals. If Native American culture had gained so much in wisdom from treating nature as an equal, and modern Western culture has gained so much knowledge today from treating other cultural traditions as equals, then the individual surely has a bounty of meaningful fruits to gain from treating other individuals as equals. Even when certain that we are right, other individuals offer us a perspective that we cannot access alone regardless of their background, especially if they're of a differing background. That is, as long as we take the time to earnestly listen. Or as the Canadian clinical psychologist Jordan P. Peterson put it, to assume that the person we are listening to knows something that we don't. In doing so, in taking the time to listen, not only will we appreciate them more, but like the good mind, what we learn might radically change our lives. Thank you for joining me in this study of Iroquois Native American mythology and the lessons that it has for us today. If you enjoy this content, I'd recommend you can press that subscribe button to follow us. Make sure that you always know when more is coming. Our next episode is going to be traveling to Rome for the story of its founding in Remus and Romulus. I hope to see you then. Let me know what you think. If you have something to add, if we miss something, leave a comment, and uh, I'll do my best to respond. Thank you. I'm looking forward to seeing you in our next one. My name is Sean. This is Mythos and Logos.